The following is a CNN special report. A monster. It's my world. A madman. I run with a pack of wolves, and I've got to be a wolf. A mastermind of one of the most horrific killing sprees in U.S. history. What do you think's going to happen when I get out? The savagery that, that went on that night, it is uncomprehensible. Charles Manson transformed a group of young women into vicious killers. He was the dictatorial ruler of the family, the king, the Maharaja. A man who redefined evil and violently ended seven innocent lives. Charles Manson is literally one of the worst human beings that ever walked this planet. Now, 45 years after his trial, exclusive interviews with family friends, the prosecutor, the jury, the Manson followers. He just seemed on fire. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible guy, man. Face of Evil, the Charles Manson murders. August 9th, 1969. It was an unusually hot night on Hollywood's prestigious Cielo Drive. It was peaceful and it was very isolated because it curved around the canyon. The secluded home of a jet-set celebrity couple, director Roman Polanski and actress Sharon Tate. While Polanski was abroad shooting a film, Tate was home and very pregnant. And look at that smile, it's just like a million dollar smile, you know? family friend, Alyssa Statman. Her world revolved around that baby and just making everything perfect in that home to start a family. They were joyful times. Tate recorded this message for her father, a military man stationed far from home. Roman will be here in two weeks. He's doing a film. Oh yeah, by the way, Roman's just like you. He smokes cigars. He's uh, very sensitive and stubborn. Those are amazing recordings. You have the, the moments in time before this tragedy struck of a happy family of better times. And was it what she had always dreamed of? She was living the life she wanted. A life that would end that August night. Tate went out to dinner with friends in LA. Wojtek Frykowski, his girlfriend, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring they all returned to Tate's home at 10 p.m. Abigail Folger spoke to her mother on the phone about flying out to San Francisco for her birthday. Wojtek Frykowski spoke to another friend at midnight. Those would be the last calls ever. Sometime after midnight, intruders cut the telephone lines to the house, killed one man in the driveway, then ambushed the four people inside. Tate begged for the life of her unborn baby. Just let me have my baby, and then you can kill me any way you want. Just let me have my baby. They didn't. Tate was stabbed 16 times, three times to the heart. They hanged her before they killed her. The others were butchered too. 86 stab wounds in total. It is uncomprehensible, the savagery that happened that night. As the sun rose and the neighborhood came to life, the maid arrived to discover carnage. The police arrived soon after. Are you all rolling? Rolling. Yeah. And so did the press. At 8.30 this morning, Jennifer Chapman, an employee, came to work at 10050 Cielo and found several bodies in the house. I got a call and this person said there's something going on, you know, up in Beverly Hills. Reporter Mary Nicewender was on the scene that morning. The place was just jammed with news people, television people, all kept away from the house. You couldn't even see the house because it was behind a gate. Behind that gate, inside that house, investigative journalist Jeff Gwynn says there was blood everywhere. The murder scene was like something out of a horror movie. The word pig was written in blood on the door. The victims were soaking in it. 
Abigail Folger had been wearing a white nightgown. People thought that it must have been red, there was so much blood. Officers who attended the murder scene had not seen anything like it, and we're talking about Los Angeles PD veterans. But they would see something just as shocking the following night in the peaceful suburban neighborhood of Rosemary and Lino LaBianca. The bodies of a man and his wife found in their home. No one on the outside knew just how bad it was on the inside. Their bodies had been mutilated. They'd been stabbed repeatedly. A fork was left in Lino abdomen. Someone had carved a word on his stomach. There were words written in blood on the walls and on the refrigerator. Strange words, death to pigs, rise, and helter skelter were written in blood just as they'd been at the Tate house the night before. They found no evidence of robbery, no suggestion of motive. It sent this wave of panic through Los Angeles and through the Hollywood community. If they could get to a movie star, if they could get to a coffee heiress, then they could get to anybody. I was just sitting there watching TV. Then, 17 years old, Barbara Hoyt remembers the news reports about the murders. She was living on a ranch outside of L.A. with a group of friends. They all came in and watched the news, and the first story was on about the Sharon Tate murders. Somebody said something at the time, and they all laughed. I didn't see anything funny at it all. They lived here on this abandoned movie set, where a charismatic, self-styled guru named Charles Manson led a group of impressionable young followers. You know, they worshipped Charlie like a god. But in the days after the murders, Charlie seemed dangerous and unhinged. He was almost uh, in a frantic state, I would say. He was very worried. And so was Hoyt. She knew something was very wrong, but she didn't know what, and neither did police. It would be months of false leads and missed opportunities for them to unravel the mystery of the seven savage murders. In the case of this nature, where you have uh, so many people who are dead, and then you try to find out, well, who did they know? Well, where do you start? Hunting a monster when we come back. Friday night in Los Angeles, a movie actress and four of her friends were murdered. And the circumstances were lurid. Death and fear hung heavy over Hollywood in the summer of 69. A 24 hour vicious killing rampage had left seven people dead and their loved ones in shock. The LAPD called Sharon's father up at Fort Baker. Family friend Alyssa Statman says Sharon's father Paul didn't believe she was dead. And he basically said there's no identifications here until I've seen her. And, um, and he went directly to the crime scene. And then he came home and of course, they were all together and, and it was a very sad night. Paul Tate was forced to return to the bloody crime scene weeks later to perform another tragic duty. Back then, we didn't have the, 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 the resources that we have now. You cleaned it up yourself. He got down on his hands and knees and, and, and scrubbed the blood off of the floor. That must have killed him. He said that the one thing that brought him to his knees literally uh, in grief was, was having to scrub his child's blood off the floor. The grief-stricken families knew nothing about the strange group living miles away in the desert, nothing about their leader, Charles Manson, who had grown increasingly menacing. Charlie was getting threatening and he was, he was mean. He was beating on some of the girls. It was not fun anymore. The free-living, free-loving life on Spawn Ranch had turned dangerous. They had armed guards at the, uh, on the ranch at night, you know, like hiding in the hay, haystacks and other places uh, amongst the buildings and stuff. It was just a lot more intense. But police had no idea that Manson and his followers were involved in the Tate LaBianca murders. Investigators were instead focused on people the victims knew, 
in the case of this nature where you have uh, so many people who are dead and then you try to find out, well, who did they know? Well, where do you start? With no good leads, rumors filled the newspapers. People blamed the victims. Were the killings a drug deal gone bad? A demented sex orgy? Or even the actions of a jealous husband, Roman Polanski? The saddest part of the whole thing was that, you know, the victims were killed twice, once by the killers and then again in the press in the months and weeks after. Polanski rushed back to the States to bury his wife and unborn child and then to take a lie detector test. He passed. A dazed and angry Polanski then faced the press. There was a lot of talk about drugs and use of drugs. Sharon not only didn't use drugs, she didn't touch alcohol, she didn't smoke cigarettes. Police were stumped and answers were slow to come. Despite the graphic similarities in the two crime scenes, two different investigative teams were assigned. They didn't get along, they weren't cooperating. If only they'd talked to each other, they could have put everything together. If you look back on the two crime scenes, they're identical. The overkill, the blood writing on the walls, and it just made sense that they were, they were tied together. But miscommunication wasn't the only problem. Much of the Tate crime scene had been contaminated. There was over 100 police officers that tracked through that crime scene. They missed clues, missed evidence, and missed eyewitnesses. But reporters like Mary Nicewender and others were succeeding where the police were not. We found the, the boy that heard the shots, and we could find the time of the, uh, the murders. There were no tracks or anything until we went down the hill to look at it. Another news crew found the killer's bloody clothes near the Tate household, and a young boy found the killer's gun. Frustrated, Sharon Tate's father, a former Army intelligence officer, launched his own investigation, staking out his daughter's house. One night there were some Harleys that drove up. They knew exactly where they were going. Uh, and they drove right up to the gate and they started climbing the gate and by then the owner had guard dogs. The guard dogs came around and that was the only thing that stopped them. And Sharon's dad just thought, you know, there's something here. They're, they were too cocky, they knew exactly where they were going. Uh, something's wrong. And so he followed them out to Spawn's movie ranch. Right to Manson's doorstep, Tate notified Los Angeles detectives about the suspicious bikers at the ranch, but the LAPD did nothing. It turns out another police department was already there watching Manson's every move, but they suspected him of auto theft, not murder. When the police swooped in a week after the murders, Charlie thought this was it. Somehow they have figured it out. And the police couldn't understand when Charlie asked what the charges were and they said car theft, that Manson started laughing. But he had a reason to laugh. He was relieved relieved and soon released on a technicality. They put the wrong date on the warrant and they had to actually just release everybody. A tragically missed opportunity. It would be months until investigators got their big break. November 1969, one of Manson's followers, Susan Atkins, who was already in jail for another crime, confessed to the murder of Sharon Tate. She couldn't help but brag to some other inmates about a murder she'd been involved with. And finally, everything was put together. The police returned to the Death Valley compound and arrested nearly two dozen people. But Manson seemed to have disappeared. They find him, though, the next day, hidden in a small bathroom cabinet at the ranch. When Charlie was arrested in Death Valley, he was booked as Charles Manson, AKA Jesus Christ, because he was telling everyone he was the reincarnation of Jesus. Four months after the murders, a ragged band of killers and their strange leader now behind bars. But the mystery of why, stranger still. Coming up, inside the mind of a madman. Charles Manson is literally one of the worst human beings that ever walked this planet.
San Francisco, 1967. Free love, free drugs, dream living for hippies escaping the mainstream. But 32-year-old Charles Manson arrived with much darker ambitions. You get these kids, these children, coming into Haight-Ashbury, and here is someone, Charlie Manson, saying how much he loves them and he wants to take care of them. It was made to order for him and he took full advantage. Manson's destructive course through life was fixed from the start. I don't have any particular reality. He spoke to CNN from prison in 1987. I spent the best part of my life in boys' schools, prisons, and reform schools because I had nobody. Manson blamed his mother for his troubled youth. Kathleen Maddox gave birth to Manson in Cincinnati, Ohio at the age of 16 and went to prison when Charlie was just five years old. She got out of my life early and let me scuffle for myself. And now I became my own mother. While Manson blamed his mother, author Jeff Wynn blames Manson. Charles Manson was born evil. Little Charlie was taken in by loving relatives. The problem was that Charlie himself was a rotten little kid from the word go. A rotten kid whose crimes escalated as he got older. From stealing cars to armed robbery. From drug dealing to pimping. He sounds like the ultimate con man. Oh, he is. I, I, he's, he's got an A in conning people. Reporter Mary Nicewender has interviewed Charles Manson in prison dozens of times. He always said he's been in prison all his life. Prison is his home. The time. And prison is where he became convinced he was a great musical talent. Charlie Manson, listening to the radio in prison, hears the Beatles. He starts writing his own songs, performing in prison shows. Oh, what a mad delusion, living in that confusion. From then on, it's his dream to become the biggest musical star in history. Bigger, he said, than the Beatles. And San Francisco was the perfect place to start. Paroled after seven years in prison, he used his guitar and charisma to lure a flock of vulnerable young women. I was mesmerized by his mind and the things he professed. And he picked on the little girls. He said he took them away from their parents because their parents weren't treating them right or abusing them at all. That's baloney. Manson transformed himself from a two-bit criminal into a self-styled spiritual guru. Charlie sometimes said he was a Scientologist. Charlie sometimes said he was in the Church of the Nazarene. But the only religion Charlie ever had was the Church of Charlie. The Church of Charlie got stranger as the Manson family got bigger, leaving San Francisco for LA to secure the big record deal Charlie was sure was coming. The so-called Manson family made a dilapidated old movie set called Spawn Ranch their home. George Spahn, the old owner, was nearly blind. Lynette Fromm was assigned by Manson to live with George and to fulfill his every whim. And George liked to pinch her a lot, and she would squeal, and George is the one that nicknamed her Squeaky. Everybody was really happy, and we would help take care of the horses. Garbage runs were a lot of fun. We'd hop in the back of a you know, those dumpsters behind the stores and you find all kinds of vegetables. Barbara Hoyt lived on the ranch. I had sex with Charlie, but we didn't have sex that many times. You know, there were a lot of young girls around. Manson hosted LSD-fueled orgies, gave persuasive sermons, and made ensuring his success as a musician the family's top priority. But when recording execs weren't interested, Charlie got angry. He just seemed on fire. He was all over the place pacing. By 1968, race riots, the Black Panther movement, and anti-war violence convinced Manson that Armageddon was coming. He called it Helter Skelter. 
after the famous Beatles song. Everything was preparing for Helter Skelter. I remember in the desert when Tex was teaching us how to stab people as a murder school. A murder school teaching lessons they would need to learn to put Charlie's deranged plan in motion. Manson believed he could ignite a race war by killing several rich white people and framing the Black Panthers for the crimes. In August 1969, he ordered several members of the family into action. Barbara Hoyt was not one of them. But days later, she'd make a horrifying discovery. I overheard Sadie describing the murders of the women. Sharon Tate was the last to die. She had to watch the others die first. Terrified, Hoyt fled. We made it out and uh, we hid out in the desert. Hoyt soon had a big decision to make. Would she go to the police and testify against Manson and the family? Coming up, the trial of the century. The theater of the absurd. Kind of the circus where there were interruptions every day and the killers kind of making a joke about it. I killed a chicken once. All the elements are present for one of the most sensational murder trials in American history. It was big. I mean, they had reporters from all over the world. Seven people had been brutally murdered. Mr. Bugliosi. And it would be up to the hotshot prosecutor, Vincent Bugliosi, to win a conviction of Charles Manson and his three co-defendants. This case received more publicity than any other trial in American history. Bugliosi, who died in June 2015, gave one of his last interviews to CNN. Before the trial, I said, Charlie, I'm going to convict you. But I said, after you get a fair trial. But convicting Manson would not be easy. Unlike Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, and Leslie Van Houten, Manson was not even in the Tate or LaBianca homes when the murders happened. I let it be known that he had ordered and masterminded these murders. Manson told his followers that this would be a bloodbath in the streets of every American city. He was the dictatorial ruler of the family, the king, the Maharaja, and the members of his family were slavishly obedient to him. I fall in love with him continuously, but he's very brilliant. From the start of opening statements on July 24, 1970, the trial seemed as much about spectacle as justice. The first day of the trial, Charlie takes control, and he comes in and he is cut in X between his eyes on the top of the bridge of his nose because society has X'd us out. We don't count. A couple days later, he's put the little prongs on it. It's a swastika. So all of a sudden, the girls showed up the next day with crosses cut in their forehead. Just, it's total chaos. This is... Reporter Mary Nicewender was at the courthouse every day. Charlie started to lead them. When Charlie objected to something, the girls would jump up and object. They would sing periodically. They would yell at the judge. The antics that went on in the Charles Manson trial, had you ever experienced that? Never, and I covered lots of trials. Those antics deepened the pain for the victims' families. Sharon's father sat in that courtroom every day. He wanted to think of this as justice, and what he saw instead was kind of the circus where there were interruptions every day and the killers kind of making a joke about it. Then there were the more subtle distractions from Manson. I had several staring sessions with him. That was a stare was on the cover of Life magazine. Manson deliberately tried to hypnotize on the day basis each one of us jurors. Bill Zamora was one of those jurors. He was just staring at that particular juror, just staring at him to make it uncomfortable. 
After Manson's gaze reduced one juror to tears, Zamora was next. I gave him back the staring and slowly smiled at him. That stopped him. Sort of, you won the staring contest, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> Extreme efforts were made to protect the jurors. You're not to talk to anybody, not discuss the subject matter with anybody. On that account, we were escorted by the bailiffs everywhere. We were just incarcerated like prisoners. And the jurors weren't the only ones with restrictions. They wouldn't let the cameras in the courtroom, so the artists were in there. Artists like Bill Robles. Where did you sit? Front row. I was within touching distance of the girls who were sitting right in front of me. A front row seat to the daily drama, like on August 3rd, 1970, several days into the trial. Charlie all of a sudden picks up the newspaper and shows it to the jury. And it says, Manson guilty, Nixon declares. The lawyers argued for a mistrial, but it didn't happen. Are you uh, guilty of any murders? Are you guilty of plotting any murders? I killed a chicken once. No one from the press had one-on-one -on -one access to Manson during the trial. No one except Mary Nicewender, thanks to a source in the prison law library. Charlie could not use the telephone. So the friend was to call me at a certain time, and Charlie was to slide under the table, and then he would hand him the phone. So I had three minutes before the guard caught us to convince Charlie that I, I, he should talk to me. Nicewender earned Manson's trust and set up many face-to-face -face jailhouse meetings, providing her with countless scoops during the trial and a rare insight into the mind of the suspected killer. When you're sitting across from him and you're talking to him, did you understand how Charles Manson was able to control so many young ladies? When you're talking to him, he'd never take his eyes off of you. It was as though nobody else was in that room except you and him. I think he thought he could manipulate me the way he manipulated the girls. Manipulation and control, the cornerstones of the case against Charles Manson. A trial that's about to take many more shocking turns. Coming up. Did people gasp? I mean. Oh, totally. Violence and mayhem in the courtroom. And everybody was like stunned. Nothing like that had ever happened before. History in the making. It was the longest trial that had ever happened in California. 154 volumes of transcript bear evidence to what may be the most surprising, unusual, and difficult trial in years. Each day stranger than the last. At one point, Charles Manson even attacked his own attorney. By the third month, observers thought they'd seen it all. But then... It was probably the most dramatic moment in the trial. Bill Robles was a sketch artist in attendance. Manson talked to the judge saying, somebody should cut your head off. And all of a sudden, he leaped from his chair in midair, clutching a sharpened pencil like a knife and a bailiff tackled him in midair and he dropped the pencil. Did people gasp? I mean... Oh, totally. I mean, everybody was like stunned. I don't think his reach was quite that far. But Charlie would have killed him for sure. Manson was kicked out of court for more than a week. The judge started carrying a 38 caliber revolver under his robe in court. That's not common. Also uncommon, a jury being sequestered for almost nine months, which led to two married jurors reportedly having an affair. But just lonely people. 
Lonely, isolated, cut off, juror Bill Zamora was told a woman he was dating had died in a car accident. Were you able to go to no. the funeral? No, nothing at all. The judge would not allow me. As for prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi, he was on a mission to prove that Manson masterminded the Tate LaBianca murders. Bugliosi established a motive early on. Manson was trying to incite a race war he called Helter Skelter. I proved through witnesses that Manson was the only one that had a motive for these murders, and that motive was Helter Skelter. Manson foresaw that the black man would win this war. Later on, he said the black man would have to look around at those white people who had survived, who had escaped from Helter Skelter. In other words, turn over the reins of power to Charles Manson and his family. But to prove Manson was the mastermind, Bugliosi needed a witness from inside the Manson family, a witness like Barbara Hoyt. I was afraid they threatened my family. I, you know, I got different death threats different times. And I told her I'd give her all the protection with the LAPD that I could. But Manson's followers got to her anyway, spiking Hoyt's hamburger with LSD, enough to overdose her. But she survived. Finally, what it came down to was I just wanted to be able to live with myself when I got old. And from there, I knew what to do. And that little girl came back, and she was an excellent witness for the prosecution. Even when Manson tried to intimidate her as she took the stand. He was pretty intense. He would stare at me. The girls would, too. Leslie would imitate every gesture I did. You know, if I cocked my head, she would do the same. Or, you know, they asked me a question. Charlie goes, like this, say no. And I said yes, and he looked pretty peeved. Hoyt's testimony that family members boasted about the killings was crucial, but it wasn't enough. The state needed more. They got it with Linda Kasabian. Though she didn't participate, Kasabian was at both crime scenes. Manson did not go on any of these. No, no. She gave CNN one of her only interviews in 2009. I started hearing, like, just horrible screaming. So I started running towards the house. I said, Sadie, please make it stop. And she said, I can't, it's too late. In exchange for immunity, Kasabian testified for a grueling 18 days. Linda was an excellent witness. She told the truth and it came out. Who was the most influential witness on the stand? Linda Kasabian. The defense rested without calling a single witness. The stage was now set for Bugliosi's unforgettable closing arguments. Charles Manson sent out from the fires of hell four heartless, cold-blooded robots. That's what I told the jury. And then he pointed out Charles Manson, Patricia Conwinkle, Susan Ackin, President Van Houten. They are guilty of sin. The case finally went to the jury. It took 42 and one half hours of deliberating. And on January 25th, 1971, they had made their decision. I looked down at him and his hands were trembling. So that allowed me to say, how can we tremble? Are you afraid of me? The verdict, guilty. On all counts for all four defendants. Very, very pleased with the verdict. That goes without saying. We're all very, very happy. Manson responded saying, you're all guilty. You are next, all of you. There's a revolution coming very soon. Bugliosi had done the improbable, convicted a killer who hadn't physically done any of the killing. Vincent Bugliosi did one of the most brilliant jobs of prosecution, I think, in American legal history. Two months later, they received their sentence, death. For the Tate family, justice seemed to have been served. 
It's what they wanted, it's what they expected, you know, especially with the death penalties. Sadly for them, I think that they thought that that would be the end of it. But it was far from it. Coming up, Manson's power from prison. Do you think he could still command them to kill? I do, I do. The defendants uh, actually anticipated the verdict. They expected the worst. They expected the worst from the beginning. After a grueling nine-month trial, Charles Manson and his co-defendants were sentenced to death. We put on a monumental amount of evidence against each defendant. Finally, for prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi and others involved with the case, there was closure. Or so he thought. I'm driving a car, turn on the radio. U.S. Supreme Court has set aside the death penalty for everyone on death row around the country. There's about 600 people. 600 prisoners, including all of those convicted of the Tate-LaBianca murders. Manson, the three girls, and Tex Watson, who was tried separately. Spared death, Manson would spend his life in prison. All I've done is send him back where he came from, and he doesn't mind prison, that's his home. So he's gotten away in a large sense with murder. The victim's families were enraged. Sharon's father, if any of them ever got out, his first thought was, I will kill them. They won't make it off of the grounds. I will kill them. Just seven years after being convicted and charged with the death penalty, the Manson family defendants were eligible for release. Think about those parole hearings all those years later with Sharon's mom sitting no further than you and I to the killers and having to listen to the details of the crimes over and over. Sharon was sentenced to death without a fair trial or without a jury. I was sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. And I say to you, should Susan Atkins' sentence be any less? There was an outrage, an injustice, a sadness, a realization that this would never end. The children of the 60s that you call the Manson family. The parole hearings would drag on for decades for Manson and his co-defendants. I look at myself today and I'm appalled. Susan Atkins died in prison of brain cancer in 2009. But Van Houten and Krenwinkel still beg for their release, saying they are rehabilitated. I'm so ashamed of my actions. I was raised to be a decent human being. I turned into a monster, and I have spent these years going back to a decent human being, and I just don't know what else to say. Former Manson family member Barbara Hoyt isn't buying it. I think they're a danger to the public. I think their influence is dangerous. Her memories of the brutal crimes run too deep. I can't tell you the times my daughter has woken me up because I was screaming in my sleep. Hoyt's ultimate nightmare, Charles Manson getting out of prison. Oh, oh my God, because he's just, he's just evil. If you spit in my face and smack me in the mouth and throw me in solitary confinement for nothing, what do you think's gonna happen when I get out? He has been denied parole 12 times. And since his conviction for the Tate-LaBianca murders, Manson has been convicted of two other killings and is suspected in 26 more. Despite it all, Manson still has supporters on the outside. It's not surprising to me because he became the epitome of evil. You're reaching your hand in the grave. I don't think people realize the access that he now has. Get with it. He has these people on the outside that are devoted to him. Still. still. They're still out there. Out there, and Nicewender believes, ready to take orders. Do you think he could still command yeah. them to kill? I do, I do. There are always going to be young women who can be conned. Charlie knows how to do it. It's so obvious that Charles Manson was railroaded. 
This is Star. She says she's in love with Manson and is committed to clearing his name. It's just not a true story. It's completely fabricated. So loyal to Manson, she shaved her head and carved an X in her forehead. It's a show of support. You know, just like when they did it back in, you know, 1970, whatever. Charlie Manson continues to find gullible young women and convince them that he loves them and that they have a special relationship. Star is just the latest. There will be more. More willing to fight for Manson's innocence. He called Star from prison just before our interview to deliver that message. No, I didn't break the law. You're all a bunch of liars. You're all liars. Oh, no. My God, the evidence is overwhelming. Bugliosi has never doubted Manson's guilt. Look, since the trial, Susan Atkins has admitted that Manson was behind it. There, there's no doubt about this guy's guilt. And no doubt about Manson's eerie magnetism, about his power to manipulate, to fascinate, to terrify. When he dies, I think the country will breathe a sigh of relief. I'm a human being. I think it will take at least another generation for Charles Manson to die in terms of fascination to the public. And it's my world. He's too much a part of our lives right now. He's going to live on in our memories for a while longer. Well, God, I guess you're my best friend, being I invented you.